Hi everyone, welcome to Physiology for Students. Today we're going to talk about the cell cycle. This lecture is really important for understanding the genetics we talked about in the last lecture and tying it together to look ahead to understand the development of cancer and tumors. Let's get started. In this lecture about the cell cycle, we will talk about the phases of the cell cycle. Within that, we'll discuss the process of DNA replication or DNA synthesis. We will then also talk about the phases of mitosis or cell division. We'll put it all together to look at the regulation of the cell cycle and how that applies to aging and cancer research. Every cell has a life cycle that includes growth, reproduction, and gap or pause phases where they leave the cell cycle. Cell types within the body really vary in terms of the timing of the cell cycle and how often they divide and change. For example, if we look at the layers of the skin pictured here, the bottom layers of the skin are the germinating layers of the skin and they're constantly dividing or undergoing phases of the cell cycle to reproduce. And that's because those skin layers are very active and they're giving rise to the layers above. So this is within the epidermis, really actively dividing cells. Other cell types, however, don't have this type of active cell cycle. Once they're in the adult phase or they've differentiated or specialized, there's many cells in the body that exit the cell cycle and no longer divide or reproduce. Think about skeletal muscle, for example. Most skeletal muscle cells do not actively divide or reproduce. So if you look like a bodybuilder, it's not because you're getting more skeletal muscle. It's because you're simply adding the size to skeletal muscle, adding proteins and components of the cells that are already present. So it's not as if those cells are no longer active. It's just that their activity is focused differently and no longer on producing new cells. So think about how all the cells vary within the body. Their cell cycles are just as variable. When we define growth, growth of a cell is technically increase in size. And that's done by adding components of the cell, different organelles, different proteins, parts of the cytoplasm. That is cell growth. And there are growth phases within the cell cycle. When we talk about differentiation, that is specialization of a cell. And it relates to the specific gene expression we talked about in the previous lecture. Some portions of that cell's genome will be repressed and others will be expressed so that that cell has specialized structure and function for the job that it does within the body many different cell types in the body and a range of gene expression happening for those cells to become specialized in their function. You have probably heard of mitosis. Mitosis is also termed cell division. Technically, mitosis is the division just of the nucleus, and we'll talk about those phases very soon. More broadly, cell reproduction happens through the process of mitosis. So mitosis is when you start with a parent cell that has replicated DNA. We'll talk about that synthesis phase of DNA replication also. And at the end of mitosis, you end up with a cell that has identical nuclei. And then that cell will split into two identical daughter cells from the original parent cell. So it is through mitosis that the chromosomes are split and sorted to opposite ends of the cell so that you can have two identical daughter cells with equal and identical nuclei and the same set of genes within each. 
So essentially, this is the cell making copies of itself, identical copies. The process of mitosis to prepare for it starts with DNA synthesis. And then there are four phases of mitosis, which we abbreviate into PMAT or PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. I'll show you those in detail. And then it ends with dividing that cell through the process of cytokinesis or dynamic cell, which is splitting the cell into two identical daughter cells. So I've shown you some of the brief stages. Let's look at an overview of the cell cycle and see what this looks like in terms of putting all of these together. So we have various growth phases, which are gap phases in the cell cycle. We have a gap one or a G1. Then we have a synthesis phase where the DNA is replicated and that's referred to as the S phase. Then we have another gap phase or a G2. You put together the G1, the S, and the G2 phases, and these are known as interphase, which is the phase phases in between mitosis or interphase. Then we have mitosis. Mitosis will encompass those four phases, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, and then finish up dividing the cell through cytokinesis. Ultimately, through this cell cycle, we start with a parent cell, that parent cell changes through interphase, including DNA synthesis. And then you end up with two identical daughter cells at the end of the cell cycle. Of course, as I said in the beginning, not all cells go through continuous cell division. So some cells, rather than going through the complete cell cycle, will actually exit and enter a cell cycle arrest or more of a pause phase. This is called a G0, where cells are not actively dividing. So cells can exit the cell cycle, pause, do their normal adult thing, and not have any division. Or maybe they pause for a period of time then re-enter and go through dividing phases based on different signals around them. At the end of this lecture, we'll talk about some of those signals. So let's get into more detail about the phases of the cell cycle. So you might have noticed in that cell cycle diagram that the majority of the cell cycle is actually interphase. An interphase includes the G1, the S, and the G2 phase. G1 is a period of cell growth. This is when the cell is increasing in size, adding cytoplasm components, and it's the first gap phase. S is the synthesis phase. In the synthesis phase, the DNA is replicated. And then G2 is the final growth phase before mitosis. All three of these phases make up 95% of the time of the cell's life cycle. So I think of this as the time in our lives before our reproductive cycles, right? So I think of all those wonderful times of childhood growth and, and adolescence and fun times and all of those great times before we decided to get married and have kids and reproduce ourselves, right? That's interphase. So that's sort of the preparation for the reproductive or the division phase of mitosis. So that's G1, S, and G2. Depending on the cell type, this could be hours for the interphase, it could be days, it could even be years, or remember if the cell stays in a G0 or cell cycle arrest, it may never complete the cycle and divide. It may always be in these gap phases. So more detail on the synthesis phase. And this is 
a little bit similar to what we learned about in the previous lecture when we talked about cell, um, when we talked about DNA transcription. So when we talked about DNA transcription, we were talking about adding RNA nucleotides to create mRNA. In this case, we're adding DNA nucleotides to copy the DNA. And you'll see, just like transcription, you have to open up the DNA and use various enzymes to make copies of the genetic code. Except in this case, unlike transcription, you're actually adding the base pairs in the DNA frame. So synthesis phase, or the S phase, is DNA replication. This has to happen before mitosis. You have a set of chromosomes. You need to double those chromosomes so you can send half of them to one daughter cell, the other half to the other daughter cell, and then you have complete cells with identical copies of the DNA. This is a complicated diagram, and I want to just break this down a little bit for you. I also want to send you to this reference if you need a little more than what the Guyton textbook gives you for DNA replication in the cell cycle. This reference, OpenStax Biology, is a free online very excellent biology textbook with nice diagrams. So if you need more, go to OpenStax here, and that's where I got this figure from. So you'll see that we've got the DNA wrapped up here, and something has to open up the DNA. That's the helicase enzyme. So the helicase opens up the DNA helix. And then we have two strands of DNA, one which is in the three prime to five prime direction, one which is in the five prime to three prime direction. Those are called the leading strand and the lagging strand. The leading strand goes a little bit quicker because that's the direction that the polymerase adds the nucleotides very easily. So here you can also see DNA polymerase. So the DNA polymerase, in this case I'm showing you a prokaryote, but it's similar in eukaryotes. The DNA polymerase is what is going to add the nucleotides through that base pairing rule one by one to copy the DNA. There's only one kind of DNA polymerase for this job, and it only goes in one direction. So the lagging strand has to be done in chunks. Those chunks are called Okazaki fragments, and they'll be filled in eventually. So DNA polymerase is going to add the nucleotides to the leading and the lagging strand one by one. Going to add those DNA nucleotides to copy the DNA. We also have to start the process just like we had to with transcription. You need a primer. In this case, it's still an RNA primer, and you use the primase enzyme to start that DNA replication process. So we also have a primase enzyme here. And then we have a DNA ligase at the very end that's going to zip the DNA back shut, ligate it together. At the very end of DNA replication, you will have two identical copies of the DNA. These are the steps of DNA replication. We start with initiation. Initiation is unwinding and priming the DNA strands. The unwinding is done by the helicase enzyme that's opening up the helix of DNA. The priming is done by the primase enzyme, and that's adding RNA nucleotides to start the process. The next phase is elongation, and that's using the DNA polymerase to add DNA nucleotides one by one to the separated strands. Did you notice how when you make new DNA, one of the strands, so if we're looking at the leading strand, one of the strands is the old DNA that was there before. The other strand that's going to wrap up with it is the new DNA. Same with the lagging strand. So you always have a portion that was previously there in the cell and a portion that is newly added. 
So we're going to add nucleotides to both the leading and the lagging strand using the base pairing rules of DNA. And then after all of it is copied, and remember, this is very different than transcription because transcription is a single gene or a set of genes. This is the entire genome. This is all of the DNA being replicated. So it's happening in different portions of the chromosomes and eventually they'll all come together as replicated chromosomes. After all of this is done, then it's termination. And that is you have to remove the RNA primers at the ends, close the helix, and rewind. And that's done, the primers are removed by a different DNA pol polymerase, and the helix is rewound by a DNA ligase. Of course, it's going to vary in your different courses whether you have to memorize all of these enzymes or not. I just want you to understand that there are quite a few enzymes important for this process. So now we have replicated chromosomes. There's a little bit of terminology that I want to help you with before we talk about how we separate those replicated chromosomes during mitosis. So when we look at chromosomes, remember that humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. One set from mother, which are the maternal chromosomes, and one set from father, which are the paternal chromosomes. Put those together, 23 of each, and you have a total of 46 chromosomes in each somatic body cell. That means you have a pair of each type of chromosome, and that makes the cell 2N, because you have two types of each two sets of each type of chromosome, one set from mom and one set from dad. Those we call homologous chromosomes. So you look at the mother chromosome and the father chromosome and they are homologous to each other, meaning that they are the same type of chromosome. Let's say that this is the chromosome that carries hair color and freckles and eye color. I'm totally making this up. Mother has blue eyes and light hair. Father has brown eyes and dark hair, but they still encode for hair and eyes. So even though they have slight variations of information, the chromosome encodes for hair and eye color. So they are homologous chromosomes, one from mother and one from father. And they each have a single centromere at the center. Now they go through that process of DNA synthesis that we just talked about, initiation, elongation, and termination of all of the chromosomes get copied. They still each have a single centromere, but now the mother chromosome has two copies and the father chromosome has two copies. Those copies are called sister chromatids. I think of them as twin sisters. So you have twins of mom and twins of dad. They still each have a single centromere. Some professors like to ask at this phase, what N is the cell? And if they get tricky and ask you, the answer is to count the centromeres. You still only have two centromeres. So even after replication, these cells are 2N, meaning that you actually haven't changed the genetic information within the cell. You've simply copied the chromosomes. The information present is still the same. Okay, enough of that confusion. So now these replicated chromosomes are ready to be sorted through the process of mitosis. So mitosis is going to take those maternal and paternal chromosomes and separate them so that on either end of the cell, you end up with two identical nuclei. One nucleus that has a full set of 
23 mom chromosomes and 23 dad chromosomes, and another nucleus that has another full set of 23 mom and 23 dad chromosomes. It's very important that the sorting that happens during mitosis maintains the identical mother and father, mother and father copies of the chromosomes. So that the information at each nucleus, new nucleus, is the same. So mitosis is going to separate and sort those replicated chromosomes. Initially, remember, we're going to start with the synthesis phase, which happens in, in interphase, in that S phase, go through the PMAT phase, and at the end of that, we'll end up with two identical nuclei. And then that's followed by cytokinesis, which will fully divide the cells into two separate cells. So at the end of mitosis, you have two nuclei, but the cell hasn't fully been separated yet. Let's put this all together. The phases of mitosis are prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. You can remember those with PMAT. Adding in the synthesis and cytokinesis phases, all together you have synthesis, PMAT for mitosis, and cytokinesis. Then you have a full cell cycle, if you include the gap phases, allowing the cell to go from a single parent cell to two identical daughter cells with the identical genetic information that was present in the parent cell. We'll contrast this later with the process of meiosis, which is formation of reproductive gametes where you don't end up with identical daughter cells, and that helps to add genetic variation to the gametes. So here, remember, mitosis forms two identical daughter cells and is the process of cell division. I want to go slowly through the phases of mitosis. If this is something that is really familiar to you, feel free to skip ahead. By the way, this is another really nice diagram from the OpenStax biology textbook. Please feel free to go to that reference. It also has some good practice questions. So starting with prophase, notice in prophase that the chromosomes are visible. That's important. Chromosomes aren't normally visible. If you have visible chromosomes under the microscope, that means that they have condensed and they're getting ready to separate. You also have the mitotic spindle emerging and forming fibers that are eventually going to grab on to those chromosomes. Those fibers are microtubules. The nuclear envelope is also breaking down, which means that it's dissolving around those chromosomes so that eventually the chromosomes can move to opposite sides of the cell and the nucleolus disappears. This is all the P phase or prophase. Some like to separate prophase from prometaphase, which happens just before metaphase. And that is a little bit later in the prophase stage where you see the appearance of kinetochores. These are appearing at the centromeres. And this is the portion um, surrounding the center of the chromosome that the mitotic spindle is going to grab onto eventually to line up and pull those, those sister chromatids apart. The mitotic spindle then attaches to those kinetochores and the centrosomes, not centromeres, centrosomes, which are forming the mitotic spindle, are going to move to the opposite ends of the cell. Don't mix up centromere, which is at the center of a chromosome, with centrosome, which is forming the mitotic spindle. Okay, so that's the end of prophase. We'll give it a P with a little M at the end. 
And then metaphase. I remember metaphase because we've got all our M's lined up. Metaphase. So metaphase is when you have the mitotic spindle fully developed, the centrosomes are at the opposite poles of the cell, and most prominently, the chromosomes are very nicely lined up at the center of the cell or the metaphase plate. Each sister chromatid then is attached to a spindle fiber. Remember the sister chromatids are those twin sisters, twin moms and twin dads that are going to separate to opposite ends of the cell. So each sister chromatid is now lined up down the center of the cell. That's the M or metaphase. Next is anaphase. I remember anaphase because the chromosomes after being lined up kind of split and I think of them as looking like little sideways A's. So those sister chromatids each now get pulled to the opposite ends of the cell and as they're pulled they sort of look like these sideways A's. So that's anaphase. So the sister chromatids are now going to be pulled to the opposite ends of the cell. The cell, as it's pulling, begins to elongate. So we have the spindle fibers lengthening and elongating the cell. That's the anaphase. Finally, you have telophase. Telophase is, I think of T for timeout, right? That's the end of mitosis. So telophase is when the chromosomes are now at the opposite ends of the cell. They have arrived, those sister chromatids. So we have the mother and father sister chromatids on one side and the mother and father sister chromatids, the twins, on each side. The twins have been separated. That then you can see um, begins to reform the nuclear envelope. So those individual separated identical nuclei are now forming a nuclear envelope around them. And then finally, the mitotic spindle has done its job, so it begins to break down. Those are the PMAT phases of mitosis. Remember though, to get the cell cells fully split, we have to have the final piece which is cytokinesis, not technically part of mitosis, but an important part of cell division. So cytokinesis in animal cells, you develop this little cleavage furrow, and that then pinches off the cytoplasm and separates the cells into two separate daughter cells with those two identical nuclei that were formed during mitosis. So it starts with a cleavage furrow separating the daughter cells and their cytoplasm. So let me show you a quick little trick for remembering the phases of the cell cycle, especially for mitosis. So we have interphase, which is the majority of the cell cycle, G1, S, G2 phases. And then we have prophase, the first part of mitosis. Then metaphase, everything's lined up. Anaphase, sister chromatids separate. Telophase, the nuclei reform. And cytokinesis, the daughter cells split apart. So interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis. Kind of silly, but it helps me remember, and maybe it'll help you. Okay, so those are the basics of the cell cycle. Let's talk about some specifics and regulation of the cell cycle. So every cycle of replication introduces a new possibility of errors in the DNA. Proofreading and mismatch repair is done by various enzymes and molecules within the cell to prevent those errors from moving forward. Remember that any error or change in the DNA is a mutation. We talked about this in the previous lecture. Some mutations are silent, totally benign. 
other mutations can have huge impacts on the cell. So the process of proofreading and repair of the DNA is very important, particularly in very active cells that are undergoing many cycles of cell division. So this brings us to checkpoints in the cell cycle. These checkpoints ensure that the cell is paused and has time for proofreading and repair or to complete its growth before it moves forward in the cell cycle. So there are various checkpoints that read the DNA, check the cell size, check the components of the cell to allow it to move forward through the cell cycle. These checkpoints are at G1, G2, and partway through mitosis. We call these the G1, the G2, and the M checkpoints in the cell cycle. These checkpoints are done by various molecules in the cell that will stop the cell and arrest the cell cycle until the repairs can continue or put the cell into apoptosis if the cell is no longer viable. One of the ways in which the cell cycle is regulated is through molecules called cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases. This is a form of positive cell cycle regulation, meaning that if the cyclins and the cyclin-dependent kinases are present in the correct phase, the cell is allowed to continue positive in the positive direction, continue forward into the cell cycle. So cyclins allow the cell to progress through the cell cycle. Here's an image that shows the different cyclins that are present during the different phases of the cell cycle. If the levels of these cyclins are present, that indicates that the cell is producing enough to be able to move forward to the next phase. So cyclins accumulate at various stages of the cell cycle, and then they degrade when the next phase begins. It's important to understand that cyclins don't act alone. They have to bind to cyclin-dependent kinases, or CDK, and form cyclin-CDK complexes. Together, when they're bound, they're activated and allow the cell to continue. There are, of course, ways to still stop the cell cycle, even if cyclin and CDK are present. And there are different inhibitors of CDK or CDK inhibitors. This is one of the ways in which the checkpoints can be checked. In addition to positive cell cycle regulation, there's also negative cell cycle regulation. That means that the presence of any of these molecules will stop the cell cycle or put in the cell into cell cycle arrest making the cell pause before it can continue or even leading the cell towards apoptosis or stopping cell growth altogether leading to cell death. So negative cell cycle regulation is if this molecule is present, it's going to stop the cell cycle. Some examples of molecules that prevent the cell from continuing through the cell cycle are retinoblastoma protein, abbreviated as RB, P53 and P21. These are the big names in negative cell cycle regulation. You may have heard many of these being referred to as tumor suppressors. So think about why we might consider these to be tumor suppressors. Well, if they stop cells from actively dividing, they can also stop cancer cells from actively dividing and creating more tumor cells so they can suppress growth, not just of normal cells, but also of cancer cells. And if these genes are mutated, they can often lead to tumor formation. In fact, that's how these genes are often discovered, is that they're found to be mutated or dysregulated in tumor formation.
While we're talking about regulation, I want to give you a couple of other ways in which the cell cycle is regulated. So growth of the cell is regulated by a group of molecules called growth factors, many different types of growth factors, important both for development, but also for growth and change in adult cells. In addition, cells should listen to the signals around them. Often when cells come into contact with the surface, another tissue or another group of cells, that also signals to the cell that it should stop growing and stay in place. There are also autocrine and paracrine signals that can regulate the growth of a cell. What's important about understanding growth factors, listening to the signals around them, is to understand when we talk about cancer. Cancerous cells often evade these normal mechanisms of growth regulation, meaning that they don't listen to the cells around them and they may continue to grow and invade into other tissues where they shouldn't be. There's another famous regulation of cell reproduction through telomeres. I was lucky enough years ago when I was at UCSF to overlap at the same time as Elizabeth Blackburn, who got the Nobel Prize for discovering telomeres and their importance in cell regulation. So telomeres are sequences of DNA that are found at the ends of chromosomes, like little caps of extra DNA sequence at the end of the chromosome. What's interesting about these telomeres is that every cell cycle that the cell goes through, every cell division, a little bit of telomere gets removed. So you can age a cell by the length of its telomeres. The shorter the telomeres, the older the cell. That's what you're seeing here in this diagram. So here they're showing you what they have is that they've taken a little piece of the end of the chromosome and they've made it red. So here when the cell goes through its first division, the telomere is still fairly long. The next division loses a little bit. The next division a little bit more, etc., etc. And eventually, when you lose the telomere altogether, then that cell is starting to degrade the coding DNA and is now senescent or aging, and that's gonna start breaking down the DNA within those cells and leading those cells to cell death. So this in some cells is stopped by telomerase or the enzyme that can replace these telomeres and make the cells continue to have long telomeres even as they continue to divide. But the interesting thing to note is that not all cells, in fact most body cells, don't have very active telomerase or this enzyme. Cells that are rapidly dividing, we talked about skin cells in the beginning, have more telomerase activity to support that division. Cells that are not rapidly dividing often have less telomerase activity. Interesting, cancer cells often evade this telomere shortening, so they have more active telomerase, allowing them to continue to go through multiple cycles of cell division without being sent to the apoptosis phase or the cell death phase. They just continue to divide and have this excessive lifespan. Sounds like the fountain of youth, right? Could be. Elizabeth Blackburn got the Nobel Prize and I encourage you to look her up for all of her fascinating research on this topic. So we've touched a little bit on aging with the telomeres. We've also touched a little bit on cancer. Next week, I'm going to add a little bit to this topic by doing a separate lecture on cancer and cancer cell properties. There's not a lot in the Guyton textbook, but I think it's a really important topic that I want you guys to know more about. So stay tuned for that next week. Briefly, I want to show you a few things about cancer. So the definition of cancer is uncontrolled cell growth. 
In other words, uncontrolled cell cycles for various reasons. So a cancer cell has some cell cycle dysfunction, meaning that it continues to divide and it's not listening to these normal regulatory mechanisms of the cell cycle for some reason. Then we have two sort of main ways that we look at genes that can lead to cancer. The first type is called a proto-oncogene. Onco is the prefix for cancer. Proto-oncogenes are genes that can cause an increase in cell cycle activity. So if they're mutated, they become oncogenes, meaning that they lead to too much cell cycle activity. Tumor suppressors inhibit cell cycle activity like p53. If they're mutated, they're no longer inhibiting the cell cycle and the cell cycle can go on without its normal checks and balances. We'll talk more about this in the cancer lecture next week. All right, that's it for the cell cycle. I hope this was helpful. Please feel free to add any comments down into the comments below. You can also email us at p4seducation at gmail.com. And if you need more, you can reference chapter three of the Guyton textbook or chapter 10 of the OpenStax biology textbook on cell reproduction. If you'd like some practice, stay tuned for our challenge question.